Uh, first up is discussion of proposed vacant buildings ordinance. Uh, Mr. Ferris, I think you're supposed to drive at this point. Thank you, Council. Tonight we have Claire Swan and our Chief Code uh, Officer Jackie Davis, and they're going to walk you through some proposals, some concepts for your consideration. Uh, it's an issue that's been ongoing for many years of uh, frustrations for staff and citizens. So. They're going to pitch some uh, ideas to you and get your input tonight. So with that, I'll turn it over to Claire. So one of our big moves was thriving neighborhoods uh, in 2025, and this is directly related to that. Um, one of our action steps that came out of that was trying to figure out how to deal with vacant structures, how to um, increase enforcement, make it more efficient, and get compliance as fast as possible. Um, and really just getting more information and having more information staff-wise. So today you're going to be given really kind of what staff thinks would be the best tools for us to be able to effectuate this. But um, really it's all up to you. If something you know, rings out as you don't, you don't think it's, you know, you don't want to go that direction, just let us know. We haven't drafted the ordinance yet. We're just trying to take your temperature right now and see if this is a tool you want to put in our toolbox. <coughs> I will say that, um, you know, we've got Jackie Davis here, and I know Jackie doesn't present um, <coughs> as, uh, some of the other people in this room. But I think this is going to be a, um, this is the direction that I'm really wanting to take this department with uh, code enforcement. One of the most important things to me is having um, the people that are day in, day out on the street being in instrumental in um, directing how our code should be written. No one knows better than Jackie and his folks as to what tools he needs. And so I tasked Jackie with putting this together, researching what other cities are doing. And I think he's done a great job. And I'm going to hand the floor over to, to Jackie to take us from, from here. Thank you, Claire. Good evening, Council. Um, the vacant building program here in town, we don't feel that we've got, at this point, um, an overabundance of vacant buildings. But if the economy was to change, we feel like this would be a tool in our toolbox that would help us accomplish compliance uh, in a quicker and more efficient manner. I've uh, got a few pictures. Some of you guys may be familiar with this. 1002 Grove. No idea. <laughs> Never seen it before. Um, this is the Wolf Nursery on 35. And this one just recently became <coughs> vacant uh, on uh, Chinbury, 1396. We, we, we still use our substandard process on these properties. We still have tools in the toolbox to use, but this one, this uh, vacant building ordinance would help us uh, enhance those tools we have, and we still do our nuisance abatement issues, and we'll take care of things like that uh, on a regular basis. The definition of a vacant building is a commercial or residential building that is occupied or unoccupied by a person with, without legal right of occupancy. For a multi-tenant, it would be 75% of a multi-tenant structure. For instance, if there's four tenants in one structure and three are empty, then we would consider that a definition of vacant property and have them registered. Uh, evidence of vacancy would be trash debris, deterioration of the structure, disconnected utilities, uh, overgrown or dead vegetation. And basic requirements. Um, proposed in this ordinance would be to register with the city within 90 days of vacating the, the structure or 15 days after receiving a notice from the city for non-compliance. Uh, maintain the property, uh, pr proof of liability insurance on the structure, um, the criminal trespass affidavit, and a no trespass sign. <coughs> Yearly inspections and a plan of action for the structure to let us know what, the, what their intent is with that, with that building. And really, for the going back to the plan of action, I told Jackie I can't keep my mouth shut, and I always interject. So, um, <laughs> for the plan of action, really, that's not you know necessarily saying the city coming in and telling you we need you to get on this plan and do this with your property within two years. That's not our position. Our position is just having an idea of what your plan is. Do you plan to sell your building? Are you planning to just hold it for investment purposes? Are you planning to rehab your building? Um, we need to kind of know what what the long-term plan is. And, and this will be on a yearly basis, so if that plan changes, you would update that as well. <clears throat> the goal of the program is to ensure that vacant buildings are maintained in good condition and minimum standard. Um, so that minimizes the effect of uh, the health and safety of the residents within that area. It also allows, will allow us improved enforcement. <clears throat> Why register? Um, vacant buildings 
can become a health and safety hazard. They invite um, high crime, criminal activity, harbor vermin. Um, they're vulnerable to fires. Uh, it takes away the, the uh, overall quality of the neighborhood and where they're, where they're at. What it'll also do if we register will allow us to, to, to get a, uh, obtain a criminal trespass affidavit ahead of time to quickly resolve some issues that we may have um, and have them file that with the police department. On that criminal trespass affidavit, that, and we're still working on that with legal, with the requirements of what a criminal trespass affidavit would include, but that's a huge key to us because what that means is when, right now, if someone is trespassing on a person's property and we want to do a criminal trespass, we have to get in touch with the property owner and we start that process then. If we can get that on the front end, then we have all those tools in place. If some, some vagrant's living in a house, we can immediately start enforcement action against that person and write citations for them being there. <clears throat> Exceptions from this registration requirement would be a uh, vacant building with an active building permit, uh, vacant building in active state of repair or remodel, uh, vacant buildings that are actively marketed for sale uh, or lease or under contract for sale or lease, uh, less than 12 months. Uh, information required would be the contact information for all the owners and, and a designated local agent, uh, if that was the case, proof of liability insurance for the property, a floor plan of the property, uh, and the criminal trespass affidavit filed with the police department, and also be required to post a no trespass sign. <clears throat> and if there's security services, we would like information on that also. And then, of course, plan of action for the structure. Uh, building inspection would perform um, a yearly inspection of the uh, of the structure to ensure that all the building codes are being met. There's no building code violations there. We do that at the initial uh, registration, and we would also do that at the, at a renewal once a year. Uh, proposed fees. Uh, for residential, a one-time registration fee of $75, and then the yearly inspection fee of $25. For commercial, one-time registration fee of $75. And currently, we have a fire inspection um, fee, an annual fee, that it would be included in that. And then it's based on some of them, based on the square footage of those structures. The reason we rolled that in with fire inspections because fire inspection is already going out and doing those inspections. So it, really what it would be currently, would they would just mark it as vacant, look on the outside. This would allow them to go in and do, do more, and it would be charged like anyone else's inspection. A violations penalty for, for failure to register would be that... Uh, Upon conviction, a municipal court um, subject to a fine not to exceed $2,000 for each offense. Uh, and each and every day such violation exists uh, would constitute a separate offense. And we base that off the health and safety code. If you think about uh, this, this proposal, it's kind of another incremental step toward our neighborhoods and our, in our community. And I'm speaking of neighborhoods really with regard to not only residential, but the commercial properties that are in those neighborhoods. Uh, several years ago, we we through we incremented our way through the single family rental. We went to the Board of Realtors, the Neighborhood Preservation Committee looked at that as well to tighten those regulations. And during that time, um, there was some frustrations even further back in the late 90s and 2000 when there was a lot of bankruptcies and the state had a special agency that dealt with foreclosures and who owned the structure. And that was always something that delayed enforcement. It was always a cat and mouse game. I'm not saying this necessarily will eliminate that, but it'll put those people on notice that we at least have to know, maybe they have to tell us who owns the, who owns the structure and that may eliminate some of those uh, gaps in time. I know that a few of you, um, especially with the residential house that we were looking at, uh, it was always who owns it this month. So, and the same thing happened in essence with some of the rental homes that the SFR program has actually helped reduce the frustrations of that. There are contact people. They do get the education and find out what's required. So something like this uh, would, would help uh, not only 
staff but help the neighborhood or the community as well as the building owners to understand what's required and get it out there so they can they can maintain that um, it can be uh, as loose as you would like to have it or as tight as you'd like to have it if you'd like to see what some of the other cities are doing we can, we can provide that but I see this as just another step potentially of going that way toward the thriving neighborhoods and to slow the deterioration of some of our our communities or our neighborhoods that are out there questions yes. I guess I have a concern about the that last one the two thousand dollar fine so let's say I'm a homeowner and I get transferred to another part of the country and I decide, you know what, I want to keep my home, so I'm going to keep it here, but I'm going to transfer. So the, the house is going to stay vacant maybe for a couple years until I move back, but I still pay to have the lawn cut and all this stuff, but I don't register, and I could get fined $2,000? A majority of our, this is an up to, and a majority of all of our life safety codes, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, fire codes, that's standard code language. It doesn't mean that's the bench fine. It's going to be much less than that. It's a standard Class C, unless the state statute sets a limit on that fine. That's a very common throughout our codes, through I would say hundreds or thousands of different code requirements. Um, so that's standard. That's standard standard uh, maximums, but a bench fine, something like that, first offense. Of course, we're not in the business of writing citations. We that's the last ditch effort. Just like if you had a plumbing, <coughs> electrical code, or a fire code violation. You're going to get notice and notice and notice and failure to achieve, then we would cite only as the last case. But even then, those fines are a maximum two thousand. But that's not what's assessed uh, as the walk-up fine or your your fine, unless it's. In my thirty years, we've we've never we've asked for some maximum fines, but never two thousand. Uh, but that's standard code language. Because I would think that most residential, if that scenario was to happen, they wouldn't even know that they would need to register. So. Part of the education, again, like an asset single family rental or something like that, is still part of that ordinance. And in, in the end, um, that's just we're just trying to match up what we had in the other ordinances. Okay. And we would follow the notice process to the educate. So I like most of this. I like uh, registration, inspection. I really like the uh, trespass affidavit. I think that's a great idea uh, because it cuts a lot of red tape. Um, the circumstance where I have a problem is specifically on multi-tenant, and it's the 75% benchmark, and specifically uh, thinking of a building where there are no, it may not be pristine, it may not be new and sparkly, but there's no code issues. There's no right. real history of code issues. Um, but we're going to put what I would call a kiss of death sign on it, uh, no trespassing. And that's not going to encourage trying to lease that empty space. That's going to discourage. And that's what gives me grief. Well, if it's for lease or sell. Well, but you said a 12-month window, uh, you know, Buildings are always right. for lease. I mean, it's there. It's you rarely have a building that isn't for lease to some extent. So everybody, I'm not going to say everybody, but I think it's not unreasonable to say 90 plus percent of the buildings fall into that. I've been on, you know, out there looking for tenants for more than 12 months because I haven't leased every square foot. So they fall through that hole. So that's where it's that scenario, and that's not an unlikely scenario. I think I can name some that are sitting out there and they're going to fall into that trap and now they're going to get slapped with that no trespassing sign and I'm good with everything up until the no trespassing sign so I think what I would ask for is maybe a little bit more of a um, uh, call it a flow chart or whatever you want to this that says okay if we're multi-tenant especially where there is tenants with a common area I'm particularly concerned about that situation, but in general, if we're 75% um, uh, vacant, but there's no, <clears throat> either no history of uh, code issues or they've been very minor, um, so generally maintenance is good, trash, all that kind of stuff is good, um, 
we're still going to ask them to register. We're still going to ask for the affidavit, but we're not going to require the trespassing sign on that property if they're actively seeking tenants. Now, they may be overpriced. That may be why they can't get tenants, but I can't legislate what they're asking. You know, common sense should tell them, but um, or they may have some plan out there in the future that they're not ready to disclose or hasn't really gelled. But that's that's the niche. That particular little corner is the one part of this plan that really bothers me. Can I answer that? Yeah. So, and I totally I see that, and I, and I didn't see that before. Now that you brought that up, but. Um, the, one, the reason we have the no trespass sign is actually a requirement for the criminal uh, affidavit. For us to be able to use that, we have to put the person who's there, the vagrant or whomever's trespassing, on notice that they're not supposed to be there. So it's a two-part requirement. You have the criminal trespass and the no trespass sign. I was afraid of you were going to kill Yeah. Them. So, but I think, you know, maybe let, let us look into it. I think there might be a way to massage this to, to be able to address your career. Are you specifically interested in multi-tenant with regard to commercial? Yeah. <laughs> I will say that some of the cities I've spoke to that it, they wouldn't require that, um, the sign nor the trespass unless they had a, an occurrence there at that time. And I think that's a more reasonable approach. And I agree. And that's why you yeah. know, throughout the, you know, yeah. no history of, of uh, code issues or major code enforcement activity is kind of a you know bar to set to, you know if you meet that bar um, just because you're 75 percent vacant uh, you know you shouldn't get, yeah. you shouldn't get slammed with this see not would not going into specific locations but uh, Jackie don't we've had in the past a few centers on 3040 west <coughs> of 35 that were sparsely leased with the issues have you uh, have you had issues with, um, I know we had one in Old Town here where people were actually living in a house and they shouldn't have been. Are your code officers, are they seeing so frequencies of people actually living in buildings they shouldn't be living in? Not, not right now, but 07, 08, yeah, we saw, we saw some of that. So on a downturn, if it happens. Yes. Um, I guess another question, too, is looking at multi-tenant um, Separate entries, not common, you know, not a common type building. So strip zone, right? Um, is um, is yeah, it may not be possible because of the ownership and uh, the affidavit twist. Um, does does the trespass sign have to go up on the entire facility? Can the trespass sign go up on those units that are empty? I, my thought is that if it's platted separately, I'll give you an example, is the uh, Bel Air Plaza. Mm -hmm. There's several lots there. I would think that it would, it would coincide with that actual building, of that, that lot. Okay, that so with, the, with everything that's within one plat? That, that's, that's what I would, because it's on the same platted lot. Yeah. Okay. I'd we, like to we'll, maybe give some we thought to that. Yeah. We'll relook at that, and um, I mean, it may be the the fact that with I mean, I see I see your point with multi tenants <coughs> that you know people are still coming and going in that business. I want so to harm them, it? right? Correct. So we could just say for that seventy five percent vacancy that that requirement's not there. It only applies to the residential where there's no one there. Um, we can look into that. Look, well, we'll see what other cities are doing with regard to that, and we'll come back to you. And really, if you look at the overall perspective of it, that's really what I'm saying is I don't want to harm somebody when there's no gain, there's no benefit in doing so, but there is a potential to harm. I don't want to do that. Yeah, I feel like the intent uh, is for those problem structures when we're having the sure. issues. Yeah, that's, that's got to be the reason we do this. That's, that's the fitting into the thriving neighborhood issue. Councilman Jones? I just wanted to get... Uh, copies of what the other cities that are closely in the area of what they're doing for this it should help give me an idea to uh, against. Okay, well, we have a spreadsheet already made of that, so we can provide that Perfect. to you. And I had a question on the 75%. Is that on a square footage basis or is that on a, a division? Because you could have you could have a plaza that has three little tinies and a Winco, and it's 75% empty. We, 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 our thought was, uh, division. Okay. Maybe there's maybe there's some and language to put in there so you can cover both ways. Absolutely. We can look at it. Look at that, 
Other questions? I think um, based on what I'm hearing here, we would like for you guys to come back with uh, some recommendations and follow up. I don't hear anybody saying we don't want this. So, good work. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you. <coughs> Paris, anything else before we go into the regular agenda items? No, sir. <laughs> we'll go ahead and wander through these. We have the uh, item one, public hearing, consideration of ordinance granting special use permit. Council, I would encourage uh, Staff has a presentation to get out and uh, give the facts of the case uh, at the 7 o'clock hearing. I'd recommend that you put Richard on that. If you'd like, uh, Richard is here. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, you can do that now. But I would recommend we put Richard and uh, let him do a presentation for the public at the 7 o'clock hearing. Go ahead and wait for the 7 o'clock. Item two, consideration of an ordinance granting a zone change request from office district to Old Town Mixed Use 2 district on a 0 .209 acre tract of land, 449 West Main. Questions? Item three, consideration of the proposed 2016-2017 budget, property tax revenue increase, and proposed property tax rate. Council, I'd like uh, Gina Thompson to give you a few highlights of what this item is and, and um, tell you a little bit more information about this. The budget before you tonight does incorporate the uh, discussion and the direction we received from you in the August 13th budget workshop, um, including the tax rate maintaining at 436086, and also the increase to the water and sewer rates of 3.5%. Uh, we did have our first public hearing on this August 24th. This is the second and final public hearing on the budget. And then next week, in the September 19th um, agenda, we will actually have items for the adoption of the budget as well as the tax rate. Thank you much. <coughs> Any questions on item four minutes? Item five, bid award for the newspaper to the Denton Publishing Company. Our annual item six custodial services. <laughs> item seven SAS infrastructure concrete repairs. Item eight supplemental appropriation for the Steinway <laughs> Model D concert grand piano. Exciting item. Item 9, public hearing for the levy of assessment, authorized improvements for the uh, Castle Hills Public Improvement District number 7. Again, this is all consent, guys. All right. Any other comments, questions before we adjourn the work session? All right. We'll adjourn and re-meet for regular session at 7 p.m. and I call this meeting of the Louisville City Council to order. First on the agenda, Councilman Daniels, would you please lead us in the invocation? Yes, please rise. If you'll bow your heads for a moment of silent prayer. Amen. Please join me in the pledges to our flags. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Mr. Henderson, if I could have you join me here at the front. Tonight I am uh, honored.
to provide the uh, proclamation for uh, Live United Month here in September. Um, let's see, several whereases. I don't normally speak like this, so we'll just go through this one. Whereas United Way of Denton County achieves its mission to improve lives in Denton County by mobilizing community resources that help children, families, veterans, people experiencing homelessness, and people affected by mental illness, and whereas United Way of Denton County, its 20 local partner agencies and collective impact initiatives had local people helping over 85,000 people in need across Denton County this past year by assessing needs, uniting people, creating solutions, and measuring results, and whereas United Way of Denton County serves as the backbone support organization to collective impact initiatives, including the Denton County Behavioral Health Leadership Team, the Denton County Homelessness Leadership Team, Mentor Denton, the Early Childhood Coalition, school-based community centers, Bank on Denton County, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, and Project Blueprint Nonprofit Board Member Training. Is that all? <laughs> and whereas this past year, more than 11,000 people were inspired by the mission of United Way of Denton County and motivated by the growing needs around us to donate $2,497,000 to improve lives across Denton County, and whereas United Way of Denton County continues to find new ways to serve the community through people helping people. Now, therefore, I, T.J. Gilmore, Deputy Mayor of the City of Louisville, and on behalf of the, city, of the Louisville City Council, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2016 as Live United Month in the City of Louisville and joins United Way of Denton County donors, volunteers, and partners in calling all residents to live united. Thank you for your service. Thank you, T.J. Much appreciate appreciated. It. And I know you would love to say a couple of words. <laughs> I would love to. You know, there's so much that can be said, but really to this group that made such a profound decision a few weekends ago, the only thing I really can say to you is thank you for stepping in the gap with Commissioner's Court, City of Denton, to provide emergency funding when the ESG, the Emergency Solutions Grant of $600,000 was lost in this community. The lives you are touching with that one time, we heard you very clearly, one time emergency relief, it's just, it's beyond words. So from Friends of the Family, um, from Salvation Army, from I mean, all of the organizations you helped, including CCA here in Louisville, you came in at a time when it seemed very, very dark. So council, thank you so much for stepping in the gap and doing that. We're deeply appreciative. Item D1, continued public hearing, consideration of an ordinance granting a special use permit for a gasoline service station on a 1.379 acre lot located at the northeast corner of FM 544 and Old Denton Road, FM 2281. The SUP request is for a 7-Eleven brand gasoline service station with six pumps that will also have a neighborhood convenience store. The gasoline service station portion of this site requires approval of an SUP, P&Z recommended approval by the vote of six to nothing with the condition that the required masonry screening wall be increased from six feet to eight feet in height. And the recommendation is that the city council approve the proposed ordinance as set forth in the caption above. I um, have several folks here that are to talk, but first we've got a brief presentation from city staff. Richard. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council. Uh, I will keep my comments very brief this evening. Um, I'll first start off with a history of the zoning in the general area, and then I'll give you an overview of the case as it went before the P&Z. Uh, this site is a part of an overall 68-acre site that had been zoned light industrial for many years up until about 2001. Uh, in August of 2001, the 68 acres was rezoned to general business in anticipation of some major retail development at that area in conjunction with the development of the Sam Rayburn Tollway. Um, as many of you may, uh, may know, the major retail uh, established itself about two miles to the east uh, at the Josie Lane intersection with 121 with major anchors of Walmart, Target, and Kroger. So the next uh, zoning action that occurred was in 20, uh, 2013, and that's when the Wendell Meadows neighborhood was rezoned from general business uh, to a state townhome. 
um, that did not involve the two hard corners on the southwest corner and on the southeast corner. And the uh, subject site is on the southwest corner of this overall 68 acres. Um, the application, uh, first application itself went to the PNZ um, April 19th of this year. And um, during the public hearing, there was quite a bit of uh, concern from neighborhood residents about the proposal. So the uh, PNZ continued that public hearing to give the applicant an, ap an opportunity to visit with the, uh, with the neighborhood and address some of their concerns. Uh, they came back again two weeks later on May the 3rd and uh, most uh, more residents had showed up with additional concerns and uh, therefore the P&Z recommended denial of that application uh, due to the concerns of the residents and mostly concerning crime, traffic, noise, uh, fumes, uh, and so forth. The applicant withdrew their, that application on May the 9th in order to uh, reach out to the neighborhood and further discuss their concerns. The applicant submitted a second SUP application in June. That application went before the PNZ on August the 2nd. And uh, at that meeting, uh, the applicant uh, went into detail addressing all of those issues. And uh, the PNZ then recommended unanimous approval at that meeting. Um, with that, I will, uh, well, before I turn it over to the applicant, I do want to mention that uh, overall the, um, the applica application involves six gasoline pumps uh, with a 2,940 square foot convenience store building on the site uh, with enhanced architecture and enhanced landscaping. And I do note also that they uh, also made the commitment to only construct a monument sign and no pole sign on the site. Uh, so with that, I would like to introduce Karen Mitchell with um, Mitchell Planning Group, LLC, and she'll provide additional details on the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mitchell, if you could state your name and address for the record. I will do it. My name is Karen Mitchell, Mitchell Planning Group, 7823 Nine Mile Bridge Road in Fort Worth. Deputy Mayor and members of the City Council, thank you so much for allowing me to come before you this evening and to present this. I would like to also thank the City staff for all of the help that they have given to us in, in getting us to this point. As you know, we're not here uh, in order to ask to construct a 7-Eleven convenience store. We're actually here to get the SUP for the ancillary use of there being uh, six um, and I'm trying to do this at the same time, I don't multitask really well together, <clears throat> to put six fueling pumps at this location. Richard has gone over a lot of the history of this site, so I won't necessarily go over it a whole lot with you, but as you can see, this was the plat that was actually approved in 2013. The area in yellow is showing the area that was uh, maintained to uh, be general business. This is a copy of our site plan right here that shows the relationship between our use and the adjacent uh, lot, which is the HOA lot. You'll see the swimming pool at this location. The area in yellow, actually I'm going to point that out. You'll see the canopy um, and then the, the portion that's going towards Old Denton Road. All of that in yellow is the reason why we're here this evening. To give you a spatial relationship, of this so that you can see um, kind of where our property is located in the in the big picture of things. The area that shows the little orange rectangle right there would be the area that would encompass not just the canopy but also the the underground storage tanks. So when you look at what the purpose is of an SUP, and, and you guys have done this for a while, those of you who, who are relatively new to the council, we're on PNZ for quite some time, and you know that the purpose of the SUP is to take a land use that might have otherwise been, con you know, worked okay, but when it's kind of close to certain areas, there may be mitigating measures that need to take place to make sure that it does become compatible with the surrounding properties. Generally speaking, convenience stores with fuel cells lo are typically located on the fringe of neighborhoods. It's standard planning practices. It's considered a neighborhood service type use, meaning it's, an, it's a use that supports the neighborhood. And it is typically found at the intersection of two primary arterials. We went and looked at, we did a Google Earth, and I'll go through this. You guys, you guys know because we've all driven around everywhere and we see where 
typically you'll see the gas station C stores. But we did a Google Earth around the Metroplex. These are locations of those that are in the Frisco area. Here we have them located in Flower Mound. And here we have some that are located in the grid of Plano. We did listen to the neighborhood concerns at the meetings uh, prior to us requesting the withdrawal so that we could work with the neighborhood. We've made every effort uh, to work with them. We met at the meeting, um, excuse me, let me back up. Prior to us resubmitting our application to the city, the um, owner of the property hired a consultant specifically to work with the neighborhood on this. So a lot of effort was made. She is present tonight in the event that you guys have any questions you would like to ask of her. And I believe the city staff included a letter that was from her kind of outlining all of her efforts. The major concerns that were brought up at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting from the neighborhood had to do with traffic, fumes, tank explosion, crime, fuel spills, and a decrease in property values. Just to bring up the traffic concerns, a lot of the comments that were made on this was they, I think the concern the neighborhood had really was, gener was from existing traffic that's there right now, nothing that our site is going to generate. Our type of land use is a land use that is, does not typically generate traffic. What we do is we take from existing traffic. Other retail type establishments are typically the ones that people will drive to go to, but a gas station C store is normally, we're gonna be taking the traffic that's already there and try to, um, to accommodate them. Some of the property owners wanted to see if we could put in a left turn lane on Old Denton Road. Others were wanting a traffic signal at this location. Others had brought up that they wanted to have a right turn desail lane into the subdivision. We contacted the city of Louisville's engineering department and um, I believe that, that they're here tonight in case you have any questions for them about what I'm about to say, but they said that our development does not warrant any of these things, the right turn lane, the left turn lane, or a traffic signal at this location. One of the questions that really became a concern of the Planning and Zoning Commission that we really did not do as good of a job as we needed to the first go round, I don't think, in explaining um, the vapory recovery system. And so what I'd like to do is kind of go over the vapor recovery system at this time. There's two, two forms of it that we're dealing with. We're dealing with something that's called the onboard um, recovery. Let me, let me back up just a little bit. We've got the onboard recovery. That's, that is where vehicles that were built after 1998, it was mandated by the federal government that they have this onboard recovery system to um, take care of the fumes or the vapors that come off of the, the car and at the gas pumps. In addition, we also have what is called the vapor recovery system where we've got the pipe system. So when this has to do at the tank itself, that stage two was a, was a mandate by the TCEQ. That was back in the day where you, when you put the nozzle into your gas tank, it had that huge, like, I guess, apron or rubber thing that was around it. That was part of stage two recovery. That's no longer in effect because of the fact that technology now has it where there's actually a separate line in the hose when you go to, to fill your car up with gas that is vacuuming out the fumes while you're putting gas into the tank. Those fumes then, if you'll look on this next slide, you'll see the vent pipe location. Our vent pipes are located right by the underground storage tank, which is located right there adjacent to the old Denton Road right of way. You'll see where it says vent pipe location. So in actuality, what happens is, is that when the tanker trucks come in, to, uh, to refill the, the underground storage tanks, they are then sucking out or vacuuming out any of the vapors that were caught in this particular area. So between those two um, <coughs> technology, I guess, uh, is the reason why we no longer have the stage two that's required by the TCEQ. 
There was concern <laughs> about increased crime, and I'm just going to go over this very, very quickly here. We have eight stores in Louisville right now. Five incidents have been reported in the last 10 years. No incidents have been reported on these eight stores over the last three years. Crime specialists have said that typically when you have a 24-7 operation, such as a C-store with fuel sales, because of the way it is lit up and because somebody is there 24-7, that this is actually a better situation than one that closes at dark. Those are the places that have a tendency to have a higher crime rate. The National Crime Prevention Council has recognized 7-Eleven as a leader among retailers in the crime deterrence and employee and customer safety. According to a public safety data technician with the Louisville Police Department, uh, she has stated to us that the police department does not show crime to be greater at a C store than any of the other allowed uses in the retail district. As you can see, these are, um, we're showing how it's well lit. We've got the, what's called the dark sky um, lighting, which is um, kind of above and beyond what y'all's minimum requirements are. None of our lights will bleed over into adjacent properties. It will all be contained on our site. Another concern that was brought up had to do with uh, fuel spills and explosions. In your packet, we included the technology that 7-Eleven actually uses. And they use a state-of-the-art uh, system. It's a double-walled system. Let me see if I can get to that slide real quick that will show you in the brochure. Oh, it may not be there, I'm sorry. It's, it's in your brochure, but it, it, it has to do with these tanks. There's a double-walled system there so that if a leak is detected in the first wall, an alarm will go off and it shuts it down immediately. This is something that is monitored 24-7. It is, it is a, a constant monitoring. Similar projects, one of the other comments that was brought up had to do with um, the concern about devaluing the property. We went through and looked at other upscale uh, areas in the Metroplex that had 7-Elevens adjacent to um, some of the higher end uh, types of, of residential areas and we did not find in Frisco or in South Lake, um, we did not find this to be a fact that, um, that by putting a 7-Eleven at this location or any gas station C store, but, but particularly the smaller one, um, that this could devalue the property. Again, keep in mind that we're not locating right abutting a residential lot. We're abutting a non-residential lot, even though it's zoned residential. It's the HOA lot. Again, we're looking at the, the slide for the spatial relationship. I'm going through these a lot faster, so not to keep y'all. So we looked at what kind of uses are allowed there by right. So what uh, Mr. Lubke brought up in his staff report was this property was all zoned general, be, uh, general business for quite some time. Even, even prior to 2003, there was anticipation that there was going to be a lot of retail at this particular location. The two lots that were um, maintained as the general business district, these are the types of uses that can go there today by right with absolutely no SUP. There's no architectural standards other than what is in your ordinance. Um, there's no requirement for site plan approval from the Planning and Zoning Commission, City Council. These can go there by right. Liquor stores, tattoo parlors, pawn shops, convenience stores. Other establishments by right are going to be your restaurants, drive through and sit down, business and commercial schools, medical and professional offices up to three stories in height, video arcades, carpentry, you can see the list goes on and on. Additionally, what, what it is that we are providing is we're, we, we have, how do I put this, I'm going to say it nicely for Richard. He says that when they meet with developers, they try to get as much as they can from the developer before it even comes before the Planning and Zoning Commission to mitigate any kind of potential negative uh, issue that might come up. So from this, what we are using is we're using brick and stone in order to be compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. We've designed a gable roof on both the store and the canopy. We've added, actually those are not cupolas, I changed it in my, it's actually dormers. We've added dormers to the store to blend and look like it's an integral part of the residential neighborhood. 
We proposed a six foot high uh, screening wall, but at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, the Planning and Zoning Commission asked if we would consider going to an eight foot wall to help mitigate some of the neighborhood concerns, and we definitely agreed that we would do that. Also, we are uh, putting in a much larger landscape buffer yard. I don't know if, if I'm sure y'all read this in the staff report, but because of a lot of the utility lines that are in the front along the, the two road frontages, we aren't able to plant our trees right there. So what we agreed to do was plant our trees behind to add to the, the, the buffering. So not only are we doing a 25 foot buffer yard between the HOA lot and our property, our, our, the store, it goes all the way up to 60 feet in some places. We have a standing seam metal roof. I already went over the dark sky lighting. We're proposing to put a seven foot high monument sign versus the allowed 30 foot pole sign. And again, we've designed the site so that the canopy will be located adjacent to the intersection at the primary arterials and away from the residential uses. This will show you um, what our design is. I'm going to just kind of flip through these. This is our standard elevation. I know that all of y'all are familiar with this. So hopefully you'll be able to see that um, on this one we're showing what our standard is compared to what it is that we're proposing in an effort to try to blend in and look like it is part of a master planned community with the existing residential. This shows you our standing seam metal roof with the stone columns. Monument sign versus the allowed pole sign. So on this right here, I'm talking about the known versus the unknown. And I, the neighborhood opposition that we had, a lot of this presentation was done in an effort to try to work with them because we weren't able to really have any meetings with them. So forgive me if I'm talking too much or going into too much detail. But what we were trying to explain is with an SUP process, you actually get what we refer to as you know what's going there. We're you pretty know. good with the SUP process. Yeah, right. Okay, well then I'm just going to flip right on through. So this gives an example of when there's no buffer yard that's required. You have a residential use up against a non-residential use. I'm just going to flip through. This right here just shows architectural compatibility. This right here, what we did is we took a, a uh, if it was allowed, three-story office building, what could possibly go there? This is, this is the not known, the known versus the not known. And back to what our area is. So in summary, We've met with the city's planning professionals and designed a facility that has the staff support. We met with the plant city's planning and zoning commission and received a un unanimous recommendation of approval. We've tried and I believe that we are continuing to have dialogue with some of the property owners. I believe that there's going to be some here that are going to speak. We, um, there's some things that, that because my client owns the other two properties, they're going to continue to work with the neighborhood as they develop those on certain areas that they're able to work with them on, and they'll continue to do that. But at the end of the day, we believe that the application before you, with everybody knowing exactly what can go there, anything that changes, have to go back through the public hearing process. So that being said, we believe that we meet all of the criteria for approval of an SUP. With that, I'll answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Ms. Mitchell? Yes, Thank you. One question. Um, being a retail site, I'm assuming y'all did traffic studies. Um, so this uh, Wendale uh, Meadows neighborhood, what What's the what's the estimated tr daily traffic count circling that neighborhood? Do you know? Well, yeah, we did, and we, and we had anticipated there might be a question that came up on that. We were able to get with the 2014 tech stock counts and look at this entire surrounding area just to, to kind of give you an example on what's going behind the majority of this um, of this subdivision, you're looking at about 138,000 trips just on the toll road portion of it.
But if we look at how much traffic on average is, is in this particular area right here, we're looking at approximately 50,642 trips. That includes the toll road, that includes parts of Business 121, and that includes the um, existing Parker Road and Old Denton Road. Now, Parker Road right now is only um, averaging 9,082 trips per day, but with the new design of TxDOT, and I hope if somebody in engineering might be able to tell me anything different, it's my understanding that they're designing Parker Road for, I believe it's 23 to 25,000 trips a day. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. And forgive me if I mis mispronounce a name or misinterpret some handwriting. Um, we have uh, Mr. Gary Fullington, who is the owner. He's here to answer any questions for council, if there are any. I'm for any questions. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you being here. I have uh, Shai Roos, um, not here to speak, but in, su uh, in support and available for any questions. And then I have um, Amit Trevesley, and you're here to speak in support. Uh, that is correct, sir. Do you, uh, if you would please, uh, your name and your address for the record, okay. or, or if you're just here to answer questions. Uh, can I make a request? We have three neighbors living in the same community. We all going to talk about the same thing. How about if the one individual can come forward? For the, for the group? Yes, for the okay. group. Is that uh, Lakani? Feroz. Feroz Lakani? Yes, wonderful. I've got you here too, so come on up. Okay. And if you just uh, name and address for the record. Sure. My name is Feroz Lakani. Um, address is 314 Wendell Drive, Louisville, 75056 in Texas, of course. Good <coughs> evening, members of the council and city staff. Um, just a few things that I would like to talk about here and just to uh, support the project of 7-Eleven that is coming up on FM 2281 as we agree with the builder that he's gonna build an eight foot wall near the community swimming pool. And if they further build something along the line of the community swimming pool, they're gonna build eight foot wall further down to cover the lot, the residential lots that are gonna be built by Lennar. Uh, second thing, they agreed to build hopefully eight foot wall, not wall, probably a fence along the line on Prairie Glen um, right by the property line that they have currently, even though it's not the same lot as 11 it's a separate lot, but they agreed that if they build something in the future, uh, they will build a fence right along the line there. And they also agreed that if they sell the land to somebody else, they will put it in the contract that whoever buys it, they're uh, they entitled to, or they have to build a fence along the line of the property there. Third thing, uh, there's a question about the driveway that we were concerned about, uh, right on the Prairie Glen Street. The proposal was to build a driveway to go into the property if uh, the property is fully built out. And we were just concerned that the driveway should not be aligned with the Vendale Drive that goes into the community. So we're requesting them to build the driveway that goes into the shopping center or whatever is building later on. Uh, little close to FM 2281, not along the line of Windell Drive. And they agreed to do, the, to do that too. So I guess these are the only concerns we have. Great, appreciate the feedback, thank you. Thank you. Those are all the speakers that I have who have filled out cards um, to address this issue. Is there <clears throat> any other comments to be made? All right, with that I can uh, entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Move to close the public hearing. Second. I have a motion and a second from uh, Councilman Ferguson and Ronald Jones. Jones. I wanted to go Daniels. <laughs> um, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Um, Opposed? Hearing none. Public hearing is closed. Now we need a vote on whether to approve. Move to approve. Second. All right, I've got a first and a second. City Attorney. 
This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending the zoning ordinance by granting a special use permit for a gasoline service station on a 1.379 acre lot legally described as Lot 1R, Block M, Wendale Meadows Edition, Phase 1, located on the northeast corner of FM 544 and Old Denton Road, FM 2281, and Zone General Business District, GB, providing for a repealer, severability, and a penalty, and declaring an emergency. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Thank you all for all your work. Item two, public hearing, consideration of an ordinance granting a zone change request from Office District to Old Town Mixed Use 2 District on a 0.209 acre tract of land located at 449 West Main Street. Administrative con comments. Uh, the requested zoning of OTMU 2 is consistent with the Old Town Master Plan. PNZ recommended approval by a vote of five to zero. Recommendation that the City Council approve the proposed ordinance as set forth in the caption above. Uh, have a public hearing. Anyone, I don't have any speaker's cards. I will entertain a Make motion. Make a motion to close public hearing. No, thank Second. you. Second. Councilman Daniels, Councilman Jones. All those in favor, close. Aye. 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 Motion passes. Need a motion? Make a motion to approve. Second. All right, I've got a motion and a second. This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending the zoning ordinance by rezoning approximately 0.209 acres out of the JW Craft Survey, abstract number 295, located at the northwest corner of West Main Street and North Edna Avenue at 449 West Main Street from Office District OD Zoning to Old Town Mixed Use 2 District OTMU 2 Zoning, correcting the official zoning map preserving all other portions of the zoning ordinance, determining that the public interest and general welfare demand the zoning and change and amendment therein made, providing for a repealer, severability, and a penalty, and declaring an emergency. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Easy, right? <laughs> had, had Nika queued up and everything. Um, Next, public hearing, consideration of the proposed fiscal year 2016-2017 budget, property tax revenue increase, and proposed property tax rate. The proposed fiscal year 2016-17 property tax rate is .436086, equal to the current .436086 tax rate. The proposed budget includes changes made by City Council at the budget workshop. This will be the second and final public hearing. The recommendation is that the City Council conduct the public hearing. So with that, I have um, uh, Gina and Matt are available to uh, answer questions about the budget. Um, and I do have one speaker card from uh, Mr. Brian Kelly. Can't believe I'm on. Mr. Kelly, if you would, name and address for the record, please. Absolutely. My name is Brian Kelly. I live at 1104 Willow Ridge Circle in Louisville. Thank you, council members, for the work that you do, including a full Saturday reviewing and amending the proposed budget in fine detail. Thank you, City Manager Donna Barron, for her work in preparing the budget with multiple options. Thank you, fellow citizens and residents, for attending. A few weeks ago, I wrote a letter to the editor of the Louisville Texan Journal. In it, I discussed the big picture for the city. The first paragraph. The Louisville City Budget, or I'm sorry, the Louisville City Council just finished an exhausting budget workshop. They funded necessary items such as police, fire, various city services, and staff. They also gave most city employees a 5% raise. When was the last time you received a 5% raise or received a raise that large for doing the same thing day in and day out? I'm not against raises. I completely understand and respect the funding items in the general fund. I am also for merit and step raises in base salary. However, I believe the City Council got loose with the funds by adding an extra 2% upon the 3% general, 3.3% police, and 3.4% firefighter raise. A 5% raise in any government or silver service job is completely unheard of. Again, I do not agree, disagree with the raise in pay, just the amount. Under the proposed budget, my city tax payment goes up $113. It's more than 10% because I did one permitted, and only one, uh, improvement on the house. So mine went up more than the 10% allowed by the homestead exemption. Continuing my letter to the editor. Where did they get this money? They took it out of your home, literally. It's like it's a HELOC, like it just magically appeared. What city council member Neil Ferguson 
as quoted in the Louisville Texan Journal, calls a robust, robust surplus, is really taking more money out of your paycheck. $100, right there. Why? Because our neighbors decided to sell in a good market, make some good profit, and leave. They left us with higher home values, but no change in income. Thus, the city council has decided that you owe more money, on average $76 more per year from now on, or over $187 more per year the last four years. My beef isn't with the raise in the amount that I'm paying. It's that every year for the past four years, the raise has increased. A few years ago, FY 2014, the raise was $16 a year. In 2015, the raise was $38 a year. In 2016, with the city budget, on top of the 16 and 38, this is the average numbers that come from the city budget, I have to pay now another $55. And this year, 2017, the average is another $76. That's how I get to $187 more over the past four years. So in conclusion, I would ask that the city find a middle ground that lets the city pay its employees fairly with the raise while maintaining a role of good steward of the taxpayer dollars. Because we cannot continue on this line, and I graphed it trying to find an exponential function or some other kind of function, Right now, it's a straight line that goes up about $20 a year of the increase of the increase. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Staff, if um, we can have you just do a brief uh, description of uh, the pay structure that we, we approved, just so that we have that on the record as well. Yes, this year the council did approve a 3% in the preliminary budget as well as a 2% when we went to budget workshop for merit increases. Um, I believe the criteria that we looked at this year was a bit unique and from different uh, prior years in that we looked at the difficulty we were having with the police hiring in particular and what the other cities were doing in terms of salary increases for our police and our fire. And that was really the impetus for looking at it this year. Um, normally, we have done a 3% the last five years, so a 5% this year is unique, and it moves the city from a lag structure to a lead structure in terms of city um, parity with other cities. And that's something our HR director could talk about a little bit more if you'd like. Um, the discussion that we had regarding tax rates, um, a lot of times we get the... Uh, meshing of the value increases versus the tax rate increases that we as the city council and city staff propose every year. Um, values have in, continued to increase um, this fiscal year as well as prior fiscal years and that's really where Mr. Um, Kelly is getting his average increases for what he pays for his house. Um, we will, I do want to reiterate that the city here um, is at a 43 cent tax rate the second lowest of any survey city in the area that we, in the Metroplex. We also are at um, 13 of the 16 survey cities that we look at are actually over 60 cents on their tax rate. So just to give you an idea of how low our city tax rate is currently and how low it's been historically. So I want to make sure that that's um, on the record as well. The other thing I wanted to talk about was our employees this year actually also received a 3% increase in their employee premiums for health care insurance. And so that was another factor that went into the 5% increase. I would be happy, though, to meet with Mr. Kelly and answer any of his concerns and kind of make sure that I can address whatever his concerns are and make sure he understands the thought and the uh, methodology that went into the decisions that were made by council this year at, at our budget workshop. Thank you. Just a quick question. Um, we, we don't have budgets, and it doesn't change my opinion about what we did and why we did it. I'm just curious. I know that a lot of the other cities still haven't adopted their final budget, so it's a little early to say, but uh, you talked about moving from lag to lead. Uh, when, the, when the dust finally settles, do we still figure we're going to be lead, lag, or in the middle? When the dust finally settles, I think we'll be in the middle. When we go to do our salary survey next fiscal year, I think we'll be right in the middle. Okay. Um, That's what I had anticipated based on the numbers that I'd seen. So I'm comfortable with that. Thank you. All right. Looking for a motion to close the public hearing. Make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. second. I have a uh, motion and a second from uh, Councilman Jones. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 
Opposed? All right, public hearing is closed. I'll entertain a motion to, where are we here? I'm a page behind. Let's see, approve the proposed ordinance of the, why am I page off? Pardon me, haven't read yet. Oh, we're done, that's it. We're done. Yeah. That's it, that's why I couldn't say it. <laughs> no there we go, no ordinance today. So then we will be dealing with the tax rate at the next council um, meeting, so. All right, next up we have the Visitor Citizens Forum. At this time, any person with uh, business before the council not scheduled on the agenda may speak to the council. No formal action can be taken on these items at this meeting. I do not have any... Um, Disappointment. Poor Siri. Uh, I do not have any cards filled out to speak at the uh, Visitor Citizens Forum. We'll go ahead and move on to the consent agenda. All the following items on the consent agenda are considered to be self-explanatory by the council and will be enacted with one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member or citizen so request. For a citizen to request removal of an item, a speaker card must be filled out and submitted to the city secretary. I do not have any item removals either from the public or from council, so I'll entertain a motion. Motion approved. Move second. Approve. And a second, there we go. All those in favor of the consent agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda passes. And with that, we will move into reports. We'll start on that side of the table. Nothing? Nothing? Chief? Nothing, sir. Chief? Nothing. Quiet day in Louisville. So far. Lake level? We're three tenths below the conservation. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so it's drying up a little bit. Um, Lake Park seems to be going quite well. I keep, I keep seeing lots of roadways now that the water level's down. The project is moving well. Um, we're scheduled to have the paving Friday and Saturday of this week yeah, without rain, of course, which has been plaguing us all the way through the project. But if we can stay on that schedule, we're <coughs> looking at the possibility of opening the park 1st of October. Another yay. There's, a, there's one employee on staff that is posting updates as roads are being built out there, and he's putting them on the City of Louisville um, uh, Facebook page. That is really awesome. Love seeing that. He's actually with the contractor. Oh, then even better. All right, moving on. <clears throat> I wanted to just make the council aware that we're having our first public meeting for the multi-generational center for the design. Uh, we're working with our arch architects right now. The first public meeting is going to be Thursday, September 22nd from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at the Memorial Park Recreation Center on Valley Parkway, uh, South Valley Parkway. And at this meeting, we're getting um, public comments on, on suggestions for amenities they would like to see in the new facility and a possible and suggest possible design elements. There. So this is going to be a pretty exciting meeting, um, getting public input. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem and Council, just want to let you know that the uh, KNW and Sonic sites are going to begin demolition this week, and so you'll see some activity going on there. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Council? Yeah, I just wanted to mention, uh, of course, in Louisville, there's hundreds of organizations that are always needing your money and donations, and, um, you know, with Gary Henderson here tonight with United Way and all that they do and everything, and they're always in need. And a great time to give, because we all give, and I know that most of us give, but on September 22nd, do not forget North Texas Giving Day, because that's a day that you can leverage what you give to these local organizations. So the charity that you may be giving to already, postpone it or try to plan it for uh, November, or not November, September 22nd, North Texas Giving Day. See if you can leverage your dollars and see if we can get our organizations in Louisville a little bit more money by donating on that day. We have the 2016 Roaring Twenties Furball on November 19th from 6 to 10. You can get your tickets on the City of Louisville website. Uh, keyword search Furball. We'd love to have you out there. It's a Roaring Twenties theme and it should be a lot of fun. Mr. Ferris. No, sir. Councilman. Yeah, there's a lot of empty seats today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have some MCO grand items. 
Uh, first of all, live performances. Uh, the Lion of Texas, September 21st, presented by Sam Houston, who is the Lion of Texas. Uh, Nostalgia, um, which is presented by Tango Amor and Ida y Vuelta. Uh, that's on September 17th. And then something near and dear to me, um, Louisville Lake Symphony this Friday will have its first concert of the regular concert season at the MCL Grand. And that will feature Bao Long Zhang. He is the winner of the symphony's annual international competition, artist competition. And I have heard him play. I've actually heard him play a good portion of what he's going to be playing. And he is fireworks. Um, and I'll also just uh, tease you by saying uh, we're going to have a very interesting uh, evening, not only with Mr. Zhang's piano playing, but also a very uh, important announcement and presentation to make. So come join us. Um, public events, Acoustic Jam, always, every Friday, presented by Visual Arts League. Uh, arts exhibits, we have Don't Fence Me In, uh, beginning th that began sorry, on August 30th, continues through October 29th in the edu educational wing. And then Art and Characters of Frontier Texas will start September 17th and run through October 22nd in conjunction with Western Days. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Anything? Julie? Officer, thank you again for being here. We really appreciate the support. And with that, I am going to adjourn us into closed session in accordance with Texas Government Code Subchapter D, Section 551.072, Real Estate Property Acquisition, and Section 551.087, Economic Development, Deliberation Regarding Economic Development Negotiations. Exciting. The second time we're out here. Yeah. Right? Reconvene into regular session. Are there any action to be taken? Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>